This is It Was a Thing on TV. Spoiler number one is Dr. Lee Franz. It stinks. What is going on? <laughs> what is going on? Episode 67. Submission number 1111. Break the Bank. Break the Bank is the name of three unrelated game shows airing sporadically between 1948 and 1986. Hey, guys. Yeah? Do you ever notice that some TV shows share a common name? And uh, what I'm thinking uh, is uh, Double Dare, we've had three different versions of Double Dare. We had the... Um, the 1976 version that we previously talked about. We have the 1985 version, which we'll talk about at some point. And obviously the double dare we know and love from Nickelodeon. And also, and, and I think we brought this up uh, just a number of weeks ago, second chance falls under that because obviously we talked about second chance with, um, with Matthew Perry. And uh, there's the second chance from 1977 that we're going to talk about, but also the 2016 version that eventually we're going to talk about. Well, th this sort of falls in that category. And just like the other two examples, Break the Bank, the three versions have absolutely nothing to do with each other except a shared name. Interesting. Quite interesting, actually. Well, and... And... To find out where we're all going with this, we need to go back. Way back. Back, back in time. Yeah, let's to... get Ed, let's steal Ed Begley's tortoise and go back to the 1940s here. Yep. We're going back to when this podcast would have been called It Was a Thing on the Radio. Because the first edition of Break the Bank originated like every quiz show worth its salt that day, as a radio show. In fact, it, it premiered on Mutual Radio on October 20th, 1945, and was called by the Radio Mirror as one of the richest quiz shows in the world. That's confidence. If it's they're saying in 1945, yeah, this is the richest quiz show in the world. It has a top prize of like five hundred bucks. Only on the daytime show, which actually Break the Bank aired on ABC, NBC, and CBS from October twenty second, nineteen forty eight, to June twentieth, nineteen fifty six, for an unknown number of episodes. Yeah, it aired in, like, sporadic points on each network over the years. Yeah, and it started out as a simulcast of the radio show, which had been on ABC Radio, NBC Radio, and Mutual Radio. And then it aired on uh, NBC Primetime from 56 to 57 as a big money version of the show. Yeah, it was called Break the $250,000 Bank. So how did you break the bank? Well, depending on who it was hosting at the time, it would have been Burt Parks or Bud Collier or, if you're lucky, Peter Donald and Johnny Olson and, or Bill Cullen would call you down from the audience and give you a series of questions. If you got... Eight right before getting two wrong, you break the bank, which started at a thousand dollars and grew from there. Talk about primitive. I think the record for this version of the show was nine thousand twenty dollars. Oh man, nine thousand twenty dollars. Thousand twenty dollars in the fifties. You know how much money that is in night in twenty twenty. A lot. Yeah, probably, I'm guessing, uh, in the range of probably seventy dollars to $80,000. $9,020 in 1950 would be worth almost $100,000 today. Yeah, I said seventy dollars to 80000 so I was in the general ballpark. But you know what? 
nine thousand dollars just didn't cut it in 1956 and 57. As you said, uh, it was escalated to the two hundred fifty thousand dollar break the bank, and that didn't last long because the show was canceled by 57. Probably because the other shows at the time were, well, again, using the term I just used, weren't as uh, primitive. It it wasn't as basic. Yeah, answer eight right before you get two wrong and you break the bank. Boy, that's pretty easy if you're going for $250,000 or, you know, maybe you have to go up a, maybe you have to play the game a certain number of times to, to, you know, break the bank, maybe, you know, five times or six times. But... Well, nobody ever won the $250,000. The closest they would ever got was $60,000, which was won by Do- Dennis Dr. Harry Duncan. But, yeah, this only lasted for uh, three months. It would be the final three months of the primetime version. He had players with their own specialized knowledge and... And by this point, it would be Burt Parks who's hosting, and he had five $100 questions. Answering those questions won the right to answer a question worth $5,000. Answering that correctly won the right to continue for until you broke the $250,000 bank. I don't know. I don't know if it would double, but if you got a multiple of $25,000, you were guaranteed that money. Hmm. Boy, that doesn't sound familiar. Oh, we're going to ask you a question. Does this look like anything? No, well, no. I I was going to say, with the specialty categories, boy, that wasn't done to death. $64,000 question. Boy, that doesn't sound derivative. Hmm. Thanks, Ongo. And that was Break the Bank. And... Uh, I am left to assume that it was created by Mickey Kennedy Branson. And if it isn't Mickey Kennedy Branson, probably a relative, maybe she was a widow. We'll get into why later. But let's hop back to Ed Begley's TARDIS because we're going on a trip, y'all! Our second show, called Break the Bank, aired on ABC and syndication from April... 12th of 1976 to February 26th of 1977 for an unknown number of episodes. Three of these boxes will break the bank worth over $10,000 in prizes. Is this one of them? Or is it this one? Or this one? We'll find out in a moment in this game of hide and seek as these nine celebrities from Barney Miller, Abe Vigoda. It's Canon William Conrad. From Barnaby Jones, Lee Merriweather. The magical Barbara Eaton. Comedy star, Joey Bishop. From Hogan's Heroes, Bob Craig. Singer, comedian, J.P. Morgan. From Queensland, Bill Cullen. And Happy Days, Anson Williams. All join us in playing Break the Bank. Now meet our host. And the most cordial welcome once again to Break the Bank, where our nine fantastic celebrities are going to provide answers to our two contestants. <sighs> that gets you right there, don't it? All and, right. Uh, actually, that actually, you know what? That was a song called "Hustle the Bank," done by Stuart Zachary Levin, and it was a bop. Yeah, and you can find that theme song on the uh, the second uh, CD of game show themes at GSN put out in 2000 called the best of TV quiz and game show themes. And if that theme sounds familiar, it was used at least two other times. Uh, First, it was used as the theme as a alternate theme uh, for the Joker's wild during their million dollar tournament. But also uh, in the early eighties, it was the theme for a soap opera based TV show, uh, a, a show about soap operas, not a, a soap opera show, uh, called Soap World, that by sheer coincidence was produced by Barry Enright. 
And you this know, would be the forerunner to uh, Soap Center on SoapNet. By the way, you know who syndicated Soap World? Who? Was King that maybe? World. I was saying, was that maybe King World? Yes, it was. So, so that, yeah, that was one of their first TV shows. Then, aside from Little Rascals reruns, yes. Uh, right, uh, their first original show. Let's say. This is before they dealt with uh, Merv Griffin and came up with uh, uh, some show involving a wheel and putting it on syndication and putting a weatherman from Los Angeles in the host role and God knows what else happened there. But anyway. And, and then that Canadian who hosted Pitfall and, and Double Dare and you know hosting that Art Fleming show. Yeah. Whatever happened to those, those King brothers? No idea. They're rolling in the riches. That's what's going on. They, they, they are they are diving into a bank vault of money. A la Scrooge McDuck. Damn right they are. Well, now getting to the game, you need to remember that in the seventies, uh, there was a very popular TV show called Hollywood Squares. And uh, we all know the basis of Hollywood Squares is tic-tac-toe with nine celebrities uh, in, in the boxes. And in addition to Hollywood Squares, there were other celebrity-laden shows, a lot of celebrity-laden shows back in the 70s, like Tattletales and Celebrity Sweepstakes. And obviously you had shows like Pyramid. Match well, Game. And Match Game, obviously, yeah. Well, this was a... I don't want to say it was a, a ripoff of Hollywood Squares. It was, but it wasn't. And I say it was because, again, you had celebrities, but also, coincidentally, you had nine celebrities. So and I'm you, sure that's just a coincidence. Yeah. It, it worked out logistically. We'll get to that in a second. But also, you had celebrities throwing uh, goofy answers, sort of like the zingers on Hollywood Squares. The big difference, though, is this is more of a strategy game. Yeah, and I and I love this. Oh, game. Yeah. I, I, th th this is yeah, th th this is a great game that t takes it a step further than just get three X's up and down or diagonally or side to side. Yeah, this is a thinking man's game. This is a game where you really need to think about what move you're going to make. There, there is strategy involved here. Yeah, and and this explanation is going to going to take some theater of the mind so if you're listening you may want to just close your eyes and imagine this all there is a grid of 20 squares there are three $100 squares on each side there are three $200 squares touching on each side there are three $300 squares touching on each side there's a Wild card square. There are five bank bags, and the rest of the squares are blank. But the blanks can't touch each other, or don't the blanks? The blanks don't touch each other, and the money bags do not touch each other. But the one hundred, two hundred, and three hundred dollar squares each have to touch each other. And the way to win the game is to claim three of a like amount, or two of a like amount and the wild card, or three money bags. Or two money bags and no, a wild card. Uh, or two money bags and a wild card. And as long as you answer a question on, um, on one of the uh, money cards, you keep control. If you find one of the money bags, you can claim the money bag and and forfeit your turn, or you can put it back and pick again. If you find one of the blank spaces, you forfeit your turn. And also, we should add the 20 boxes in the game board were laid out in a 5x4 five array. Five, yeah. uh, five columns of four rows. And right. yeah, you know, five and four is nine. That's where you get the nine celebrities. So think of this kind of sort of as maybe a small version of Battleship, except instead of saying like A1, you say, I'll take box one or box eight or box 15. 
And then you've got two celebrities attached to that box. So in box one, it would be the celebrity in the uh, the leftmost column and the top row. Those would be the two celebrities whose coordinates, if you will, match box one. And they would be given a question, and the celebrities are given two different answers, one of which is real and one of which is a bluff. And the contestant must select which celebrity is giving the correct answer. And if they get that right, they get whatever uh, they revealed in the box. Uh, that's for a dollar amount. You know, you don't necessarily have to win uh, more money than your opponent. You just have to connect uh, three like boxes, and you get the and you get the sum total of the boxes that you collect. Like you collect uh, three one hundred, you win three hundred dollars. You collect two hundred, you win six hundred dollars. And you only win what you get three of. So if you get, say, 300s and also a 300, you don't get $600. You just get the 300. Yeah. And this didn't last that long despite being right near the top of the ratings. It was actually, I believe, the second highest rated game show when it got canceled. Yeah, because I, I remember hearing about that. That sounds insane that this was, like, so popular, but ABC canceled it. Well, they wanted to expand their soap operas. It is. What what came on in seventy six for ABC? Uh, they okay. It was canceled to extend General Hospital and One Life to Live from thirty minutes each to forty five minutes each. Oh man, those were the days. Forty five minute soaps. Yep. But lest you think this is the end of the road for Break the Bank, a second season was ordered for weekly syndication with Jack Barry hosting because Tom Kennedy was busy with Name That Tune. And 50 Grand Slam. And 50 Grand Slam, yes. And that, well, th th this is, again is what you get for doing the occasional research. Uh, it, it didn't uh, fare too well, at least here. Uh, I found an article uh, talking about a time change. Uh, it looks like it aired sometime either like Saturday nights or Sunday afternoons to begin with. But by late 76 or early 77, it got moved to late Sunday slash early Monday mornings at midnight. Ooh. Ooh. Of yeah. course, your market may vary. And that nowadays is the times when infomercials would air. And so, yeah, you're talking about going up against the late, late movie or or basically off the air signals. Not good. Yeah. Oh, and also we should add in the opening that you heard uh, a few minutes ago, the person who announced there is the one and only Ernie Anderson, who we're going to talk about later this year. Yes. Yeah, we're not uh, just about TV shows. We're going to talk about personalities, and I think he's the first personality we have lined up. Yes, and of course, makes sense that Ernie would be announcing this show because this was taped, of course, at the ABC Television Center in Hollywood. And, oh, there's one more thing for the second season. There was a bonus game in the syndicated version, and stop me if you've heard this one. You had to pick a certain number of of things that will get you to a target number of money in order to win a jackpot of $5,000. Boy, that sounds like almost every Barry and Enright show back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, more specifically, uh, eight of the celebrities had a money amount ranging from 200 to 1000 in $100 increments. One had a bust card. You get to 2,000, you win 5,000. You hit the bust card, the game's over. Of course, you could, you could quit at any time because you hit the bust, you leave with nothing. Except whatever yeah. you want in the main game. That, that, oh, well, obviously. And if you've seen the... Uh, the reruns of concentration on buzzer it's basically the syndicated version has kind of like the same format as 
the syndicated version of Concentration, it's two contestants the entire episode. Mm-hmm. It's always a, it's always a male and a female. Just so you, you know, because uh, one of the things they use to mark the board is a mustache and a pair of lips. Boy, that's not like gender conforming or anything. Like I said, this was back in 1976 where people were creepy stupid. People and stupid. stupid. And God help you if you're creepy and stupid. There's actually one other rule that you're missing, Chico, and it's the dollar values. If you remember in the daytime show, it was 100, 200, and 300. In the syndicated version, it was 100, 300, and 500 dollars were on the board. Still five money bags, still a wild card, still five blanks. But there was one more thing, and you alluded to it, Greg. Damn shades, shades though. Yeah, those Damn shades. shades though. Uh, you notice if you if you watch the episodes on a YouTube, of which there are plenty, you notice that Tom Kennedy and Jack Berry are are we- are wearing. Like like pairs of wayfarers or something, because apparently the lights at ABC are incredibly bright. Now the now they look the same to me, but Jack Barry could work those suckers. Mm. Yeah, those were some style and shades Jack had on. And that was Break the Bank in 1976. But now we get to the main attraction, the main reason we're doing this. Yeah, let's all get back into Ed Begley's TARDIS. Let's let's not mind the dead bodies here in the TARDIS that Ed Begley Jr. killed because he was the Zodiac killer. We got to go back to 1985 for the grand finale, and it is the Klein and Friends version of Break the Bank. Yeah, yes, Break the Bank, the 1985 flavor, aired in syndication from September 16th, 1985. To June 20th, 1986, for, say it with me, an unknown number of episodes. The number I see is approximately 180. This is our prize ball. Inside the ball is a fortune in cash, fabulous prizes, and one of television's most fun-filled bonus games. You can win a personal copier, but wait, is that Joan Rivers? Or an encyclopedia, if you'll face up to our tic-tac-toe game. Or a trip to Reno, Nevada, with the help of the world's silliest swami, Charles Nelson Riley. All this in a brand new car. Time is the key that will open this vault for one of these lucky couples as they try to break the bank. And now, here's the star of Break the Bank, Jim Hey, welcome to the show that proves that time really is money. Let's not waste it. Oh, man, guys. What do we have to say about this version? It it was... It, it had a bank, and there... And it had to be broken. Yeah. That's all we have to say. Good night, everybody. <laughs> okay, so... This was a completely different animal created by Richard S. Klein the late, great Richard S. Klein, I should say. Yeah, because we, who... we should note Richard S. Klein recently passed away back in uh, mid-March. Yeah, and this was his... This was actually his first game independent of Barry and Enright, where he worked. So, how does it work? Well, you had questions whose answers were part of a puzzle. And each question was worth a set of seconds in the prize vault. That's the name of the bank, by the way. The prize vault. They and couldn't come up with a more creative name than the prize vault. Well, it was a I bank. Just... So, so it's a bank vault. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to break the bank. Yeah. You know, it, it looks then like a giant. They call it a bank. They call it a bank. Don't call it a prize vault. But in the bank is a vault. I get that it's a vault, but just call it a bank. <laughs> Mommy and Daddy are arguing. Okay, we're going to argue about semantics. 
but uh, also we, we should add that when we're talking about this uh, puzzle format, think like Password Plus and Super Password, where all the clues lead you to a person, a place, or a thing. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I'll give you a, I'll give you an example here from our friends at Phantom, uh, Oscar, Walt Disney, Steamboat Willie, Pluto, Minnie, and Mouse. It's got to be Mickey. But, uh, 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 that's correct. That is Mickey. And of course, uh, qu- the first question is worth five seconds. Second is worth 10 the third is worth 20 the fourth is worth 40 the fifth is worth 80 and the sixth is worth 100 now each team there are two couples who competed on a show and each team could either answer more questions or try and solve the puzzle that's important because whoever solves two puzzles wins the right to open the prize vault and play for a chance to break the bank. And obviously, with each passing question, since the number of seconds increases, more or less doubles every question until you get to that last question, there's a big risk. You could play for more seconds, be a little greedy, or you could just solve the puzzle, get one puzzle under your belt, or you know, win the championship if it's your second puzzle, and take whatever time you have in there. But remember, the more time you have in there, the more prizes you can potentially win. There's one thing I have to say. I have to preface this by saying the game goes to the team who solved two puzzles first, not necessarily the team with the most time banked. Now, you have all that time in the prize vault. What do you do in the prize vault? Well, what don't you do in the prize vault? There is a, there is a number of events. Each one is worth a prize. And a bank card. Uh, you correctly complete the event, you win a bank card, and the prize that goes with it. Now, during the, your time, there is going to be a number jumbler that will give you anywhere from one to five bank cards, depending on what the number lands on. By the way, that number jumbler was uh, recycled from the aborted 21 pilot which we previously mentioned in the millionaire not socks episode yeah so for each event uh you got a bank card but there were five bank cards available for each event so there must have been i'm gonna guess between eight and ten different events going on in the the vault probably eight and i'll get to why later and so you know, you could get conceivably, well, b- between the jumbler and the different events, I'm going to guess probably about 13 bank cards. Uh-huh. Um, okay. You had to get the card that would show break bank on the reveal. Uh, they had uh, this fancy, oh, God, how do you describe it? I mean, it was like neon and it had... It was a neon glass sort of uh, atrium-looking thing. With, 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 like, money in it and and, and bank bars. bags. And, yeah, I mean, it, it looked elegant. It was, it, it was essential 80s. It, it was chrome. It was very... It read is good era. Yeah, it was very fancy chrome uh, for the era. And, and so with the contestants, you know, dashing from event to event, things could be kind of madcap... And you've got Gene Rayburn, who, well, admittedly, was a madcap host. He was a madcap host, but here's the thing about Gene Rayburn. He's a madcap host whose best days, frankly, were behind him. Don't, don't get me wrong. He was still good on this. He was still very, very good on this. But he, he wasn't as good as he was on Match Game. No. Yeah. The other problem is, uh, going back to Richard Klein, who we talked about earlier, he wanted Gene Rayburn to play this like a serious game. Okay, it's not Madcap. This is a serious game. We, we've got tens of thousands of dollars of prizes. You can't be goofing around. And it's like, excuse me, 
Your show has people running around going uh, doing different things like tongue twisters and goofy facts and and you've got you know friggin' Charles Nelson Riley and Richard Mall and and uh, and Willie Tyler and Lester in the bank and you want it to be a serious game? Yeah, really. Yeah, that wasn't happening. And um, Gene Rayburn lasted about thirteen weeks. Yeah, and at which point he was replaced by Joe Farrago. And shortly after that, I know you're thinking, who's Joe Farrago? Joe Farrago. For Joe Farrago, sorry. That's how, that's, yeah, that answers the question. Who's Joe Farrago? Oh, you don't know who Joe Farrago is? No, I know who he is. I've seen his infomercials, but so far as I know, this is his only game show. Yeah, yeah th- this is his only game show, but he's like the king of infomercials. He's no Joe Fowler, Mike. He's up there, though. And, and Joe Farrago, he was also in some other shows. And gosh, if it isn't Night Court with me, it's Married with Children. Joe Farrago played the father of a teenager who was buying a car on Married with Children. I re- remember that episode. Uh, well, you know what, guys? It wasn't as great as when David Ruprent was on Married with Children. Well, no, and it wasn't as good as when Bubba Smith played Spare Tire Dixon on All Night Security, dude. It wasn't as good as David Ruprecht shilling Crunchy Pops on future installments, Small Wonder. Well, no, I was going to mention it wasn't as good as when Todd Christensen was hosting that football game show. On- I remember that episode! <laughs> Sorry, we're marking out over Married with Children. But anyhow, getting back to the, the, the reason we're here... So when Gene Rayburn was replaced by Joe Farrago, the whole game changed. Oh, yeah. I mean, literally, you're not playing for time anymore. You're not running around a prize vault. It got neutered. And that's the best word I can use to describe it. It went from zany and madcap to... Eh, nah. we, we, we've got to fulfill our contract and... And get all these episodes done. So what happened? No time. You're playing straight up for money. And uh, we kept the, the master puzzle format. However, just the questions were worth money. So the questions in the first puzzle were worth $100 a piece. And questions in the second puzzle were worth $200 a piece. And after the second puzzle, questions were played for $400 each. Until somebody broke the two thousand dollar barrier, and they were the champs. So, doesn't matter how many puzzles you solve; it just matters that you get to two thousand dollars first. Very, very bleh, very meh. Yeah. And, and then, okay, so now, since we don't have time, how many bank cards are you going to win? Well, you play one more puzzle, and. Every clue you see takes away a certain number of bank cards. You start off with 10 bank cards, but on the uh, on the board, there's actually like a uh, randomizer, which randomizes the cards. And once you hit the buzzer, it'll stop the randomizer. So there were three single cards. Three of the, the spaces had a single card. Two had two bank cards, and one had three bank cards. So that adds, adds up to 10. That's nice, but just to play the game, you're going to lose at least one bank card. So the most you can technically win is nine. And so the quicker you solve the puzzle, the more bank cards you can take into the prize vault. Except now, again, there's no games. There's no running around. There's no Jimmy Walker or, you know, or uh, uh, Wayland and Madam. Well, Wayland probably would have been dead by then. Yeah, but so you could... Willie and Lester... Like, what, what the hell's the fun in that, Mike? Yeah, I mean, the fun's gone because Gene Rayburn's gone and there's no celebrities and people aren't running around trying to do goofy puzzles and stunts. They're just picking off bank cards off a board of 40 bank cards. And if you wanted to back out at any time, at least with uh, Gene Rayburn, he would say, I'll give you $500 for the cards you have left over. And then, okay, well, you put a card in and it was worthless. 
well, now I'm going to give you $500 and a dishwasher. So it's sort of like a let's make a deal thing. This was not like a let's make a deal thing. You just put cards into the reader and you got a prize or you broke the bank, which was there was one break the bank card among the 40, or you could hit a bankrupt and bankrupt. Boy, where have we heard bankrupt before? Oh, yeah. Wheel of Fortune, the big show that t- uh, during that time. And the bankrupt card would take away your winnings in the prize vault from that day. It wouldn't take your money. It wouldn't take anything you previously won. But all the prizes that you accumulated in the prize vault that day are gone. I mean, I remember this as a kid. The first version was interesting, or at least fun for uh, a a, a 10-year-old who had ADD. Love watching people running around the prize vault, doing goofy things, winning prizes. But now this later Joe Farrago version was just so watered down and uh, it sucked and it showed. It sucked. It was the worst game I ever. Oh, my God. That version of Break the Bank 85. Oh, well, how bad was it? At least here in Cleveland, it aired originally in the afternoon. I believe it was either four o'clock or four thirty in the afternoon. Uh, And uh, it didn't do so well in the afternoons. So right around the time the Joe Farrago version started uh, running, it was moved to 9.30 in the morning. And how bad were the ratings for uh, the show when it moved to 9.30 in the morning? I can't wait to hear this. How bad were the ratings, Mike? It received a 1. Now remember, this is back... Uh, 1 nowadays gets you renewal, but this is back in 1985 when cable was just sort of uh, evolving... In Cleveland, at 9.30 in the morning, now, it was on a big three network. It was on the CBS affiliate at the time. And it actually came in, believe it or not, no better than fifth at some times. Oh. So there, 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 there were seven stations in Cleveland at the time. You had the three major networks, you had three independent stations, and you had a PBS station. And... It was usually in fifth place behind the two other major networks and two of the independents, losing to stuff including Bonanza reruns. And, yeah, it was losing to Bonanza reruns, and also it lost on a pretty consistent basis to a local TV show called Burnaby, which, if you're from Cleveland, Burnaby is a legend. He was on for ages, but still, that was on an independent station this is on a network station at 9.30 in the morning, and it just got hammered. I mean, a one. That's bad. It was a one, and it was on between the network the network morning show and the network uh, game show block. On this station, at 9 o'clock, they showed mod reruns. And then at 10 o'clock, since it was CBS they would have shown the $25,000 pyramid. So, yeah, it did not do well at all in the ratings. And, well, it definitely didn't see another season. I mean, it, it just... It, it was just bad. It was terrible. Just terrible. terrible. T-R-B-L. Terrible. Thank you, Charles Barkley. But alas, that ends Break the Bank. 35 years later, and we still haven't had a revival. But there is one burning question, which I know Chico uh, brought up earlier in the show. And that is, who exactly is Mickey Kennedy Branson? Yeah, who is Mickey Kennedy Branson? And, And you may be saying, who's Mickey Kennedy Branson? Well, if you watch the credits to Break the Bank, they actually give special thanks to Mickey Kennedy Branson. And well, the only the, well, the title was was uh, leased from a Mickey Kennedy Branson. Yeah, break the bank. Uh, the title was licensed by Mrs. Mickey Kennedy Branson. So the best we can come up with is that either her widow or one of her relatives, one of her ancestors, if you will, 
came up with the name Break the Bank for the original radio show. But also at the same point, she was never credited on the 76 version. So who the heck knows? Hold up. Okay, so it's from the official Gazette of United States Patent and Trademarks for like 1993, I think. Or it's volume 1146, issue 4. And if I can't even, uh, it's on page 247. If you look at Break the Bank, there's a trademark filed by a Mickey Kennedy Branson from September 4th of 1982 with the title Break the Bank for entertainment, namely a continuing game show distributed over television, satellite, audio, and video media. First use in commerce, April 1944. April 1944. So my best guess is she owned the title. Which would make sense now. Well, again, either own the title or uh, some relative uh, own the title. Because, again, uh, it says for entertainment purposes, namely, you know, the game show. Uh, And also the first uh, use was 1944. So that would be radio era. And uh, as Mm -hmm. we said earlier, the the show started in radio uh, in, in the late 40s, mid to late 40s. So th- that makes sense. Boy, Greg ca- comes through in the clutch. That's good. Good detective work, Greg. Now that that mystery is solved, I guess there's nothing left to say except break the bank. It w- went from the richest quiz on the radio to a thinking man's Hollywood squares. But in 1986, it became just a thing on TV. And you know how you, the listener, can break the bank? You can break the bank by going to our website, it was a thing on TV.com, and you can go into our vault of past episodes and listen to them all. Yes. You can go into our vault and listen to past episodes, or you could go on Place to Be Nation Pop or previous week's episodes get posted on there every Wednesday now. And also, don't forget our social media feeds, uh, Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and we got a Discord, and people are using the Discord. We've had some feedback about uh, past shows and some ideas for other shows and just talking TV in general. So swing on by, say hi, leave a message. Shout out to the Discord. And if you were on Jack Dorsey's hate box within the past week, we kind of gave a hint about a future uh, subject that's going to be coming up sometime in the middle of July. And also, in addition to uh, visiting our social media feeds, please don't forget, like and subscribe, rate and review. Remember, we need those five-star reviews if we want to keep this in business. And don't forget to share because... Sharing is caring. Unless it's a venereal disease. Absolutely right. Well, unless it's any sort of disease, you don't want to. You don't want to share diseases. That's just rude. Yeah, that's that's not good, especially in the time of COVID. Anywho, we'll we'll wash our hands and sanitize them, and uh, tell you that. Oh, later this week, this is an episode I think all three of us have been yearning to do for a while, and it's a very timely episode. Yep. We won't get into why it's timely, but. Um, it's going to be amazing for a number of reasons, and uh, that'll be coming out on Thursday. But until then, speaking for Greg and Chico, this is Mike thanking you very much for listening to It Was The Thing on TV. We'll catch you later this week. Wow! All right, all you have to do is recite the tongue twister Julie is holding. Say it three times and win a bank yeah, card. A three-month truce is a truce in truth. Is the truth of a truce in truth a three-month truce? All right, two more times. If a three-month truce is a truce in truth, is the truth of a truce in truth a three-month truce? Faster. If a three-month truce is a truce in truth, is the truth of a truce in truth a three-month truce? All right, now. Grab the card. Put it in the slot.